Welcome, welcome to the mysterious book emporium. Tension is high in Orlais, but not just because of the threat of the mages and Templars. Empress Selene I fought her way to her throne, and now that she has it, it's going to take a lot to take it from her. Why don't you take a seat as we begin with The Masked Empire by Patrick Weeks, chapters 1 through 5. Chapter 1. Empress Selene walks to the University of Orlais, surrounded by servants and her personal guard, Sir Michel. She is greeted by Chancellor Henry Morak in the courtyard. Immediately, she makes a small gesture, and her servants place a small bench for her to sit on and hand her a cup of tea. Morak is surprised, thinking that he would have taken her into his office to talk. Selene is pleased, thinking on how early she already has him off balance. The two chat, their conversation going from things Morak would like to show the Empress, but she explains that she isn't really interested in any of that. Recently, she has been reading up on a particular math theorem that confuses her, and she'd like to hear someone speak about that. She had heard of the theorem when talking to a noble, and oh, wait, in that same conversation that noble mentioned they were sponsoring a young man at the university who was studying that theorem. Morak suddenly understands, but before he can really respond, Selene continues, saying that when they last talked, he had agreed to let people with non-noble bloodlines into the university. Yet, there are no students currently who fit that description. Morak argues that the young man she's talking about wasn't accepted because he was an elf. Selene turns to Sir Michel and asks the Chevalier if there is any elves present currently in the university. He smiles and points out that technically there is, as the mural on the wall depicts Andraste and her disciples. After the fall of the Dales, the Divine asks the erasure of Chartan, her elven companion. Many pieces showing Chartan simply rounded off his ears, making him look human, just like the mural in the university courtyard. Selena asks how strange it is that the university is ready to fight pressure from the Chantry when it comes to its studies, but not its students. After a pause, Morak states that perhaps he should look at the application again. Selene thanks him and asks for a moment alone in the Chantry, saying that when she is done, she would like to hear about some of the things he's working on, a peace offering. Sir Michel murmurs to Selene, saying that she might have warned him about what she planned to ask him, as the elven erasure isn't that well known in Thetis, but she responds that she had complete faith in his abilities and goes into the Chantry alone. The Chantry was empty, except for a lone, red-headed woman who greets Selene and introduces herself as Nightingale, and as working for the Divine. Selene asks her what Dorothea, the Divine's real name, plans to do with the mages and Templars whose fighting is getting worse. Nightingale responds that she wishes to make peace, but would like to know more about the situation and her options before acting. Selene responds that time does not allow them to wait, and takes a guess. I understand that during the last blight, the Circle Tower in Ferelden was nearly lost when one of the senior mages became an abomination. After killing the creatures, the hero of Ferelden was forced to decide on the spot whether to kill every remaining mage in the tower. The barb struck home as Nightingale blinked, then said with heat, we are hardly in the thick of battle, Your Radiance. We are always in battle, Selene said. It is only that some of us do not always realize it. A bard named Marjolaine once told me that. I heard she met an unfortunate end in Ferelden, she sighed. Isn't that sad, Nightingale? Nightingale paused for a moment, looking at Selene with cautious respect. I suppose, she finally said. It is a matter of perspective, and perhaps you might call me Liliana. Perhaps I might. Selene tells Liliana that she has nobles begging her to do something before it gets worse, and she needs to act, with her only options being sending in soldiers, something she doesn't really want to do. She suggests that the Divine make a move to show compassion towards the mages, and she will set up a ball in which the Divine can speak to those same nobles. Selene tells Liliana that she has at most a month to have the Divine act, and Liliana agrees, leading Selene alone in the Chantry. Briala is called by the Chatelaine, who is setting up for another ball that night. The older woman tells her that she needs to tell the kitchen workers to serve better food, or else they will be whipped. During the conversation, Briala notices that her clothes are a bit out of place, something unusual for the woman. Briala agrees to take the message and leaves, knowing that the woman has been up to something, and on a day like this, it's likely that she has been used as a tool in some plan. The question was who was using her. In the kitchens, Briala relays the information to the head cook and asks if she can borrow one of the serving girls for a quick errand, to which the cook happily agrees. She asks the servant to go find any last-minute changes to the schedule that the Chatelaine has made. 
Barella goes on to walk into the gardens where the Chatelaine has been working and is stopped by a captain of the guard, who calls her knifier and makes sexual advances towards her. But more importantly, his armor is slightly askew as well. Briala leaves and has a better picture of what is going on. The guard captain was new after his predecessor had died. Many soldiers favored Gaspard, and this man likely did as well. Just then, the servant girl came back, saying that the Chatelaine had added a bard, Melcendre, to the guest list. Briala thanks her and asks for one more favor, to check on the guard captain's schedule. Briala then begins to search the garden maze where the captain has been guarding. Selene walks around her ball, being guarded by Sir Michel not far behind. He asks if he has heard from Briala on what is going on, and he has. Gaspard has hidden a sword in the garden, and a bard as a singer. Just then, Comte Chantral of Valon comes to speak to Selene. The man has been pressuring to marry the Empress for some time, yet she has always just brushed him off, like she does just now. Suddenly, Grand Duke Gaspard's laughter rings out from the crowd, and Selene goes to investigate. A joke of his has embarrassed the bard he had brought in, making her stop playing. When Selene asks what he had said, he goes on to explain that the song she was playing sounded very similar to a song called King Megrin's Mabari, a song about the Orlesian occupation of Ferelden, and one no longer sung now that the two nations were at peace. Selene also notices that Van Tegan is standing nearby. Gaspard turns to Tegan and tells him that he has a gift for the Ferelden ambassador. He snaps his fingers, and a servant brings out a rusted sword and gives it to Tegan, the one Briala had found. He nodded to Van Tegan. It was taken off the body of some Ferelden noblewoman who got caught making trouble for poor Megrin. Moira, I believe? Behind his gold and green mask, his eyes twinkled with good humor. Our servants have been using it to kill rats in the cellars. Tegan had gone still, looking at the sword in his hands as though the rest of the court had vanished, the green velvet bunched around his white-knuckled fists. And here was Gaspard's game. Gaspard was goading Tegan. If Tegan and Selene does nothing, Ferelden looks weak and Orle peace with the nation looks ingenuine. If Tegan fights back and Selene allows it, Selene looks like she's a weak ruler. And if Selene does stand up, the peace with Ferelden is hurt. But she comes up with a plan. Going over to Tegan, she asks if he wants satisfaction from the offense, and he does. She accepts and agrees to duel him, and turns to Sir Michel, who would be the one to fight. He points out that they are the challenge party, and that they get to choose the weapons. Selene agrees and makes the weapon a feather, specifically the yellow feather that marks a man as a chevalier. Sir Michel takes one from his own helmet, and Selene asks Gaspard to graciously donate one for his own helmet to Ferelden and he begrudgingly accepts. The crowd laughs as Tegan and Sir Michel have fun fighting with feathers. That night, Briala comes to Empress Selene's bedroom through a secret passage behind a mirror. Selene asks if the guard captain has spoken yet, and Briala informs her that he has. Gaspard put him up to the task and is asking for mercy. While the Chatelaine is embarrassed but knew nothing of the plot, Briala thinks back to her threat to with the other elven servants and asks Selene that perhaps she should be chastised for her actions, and the Empress agrees. Selene's fingers trace gently on Briala's neck, and she gently takes off her mask. The two get closer as Briala turns out the candle. Chapter 2 Lamet, an elven man, walks to the slums of Halam Sharal. Halam Sharal is unique in that due to its history of the Dales, there were more elves than humans, so instead of the elves being locked up in alienage, the humans locked themselves in the higher parts of the city. Lamette's friend, Thren, calls him a fool, saying that he could have been spending the evening with the lovely Jeanette, but he chose to leave the bar instead. Lamette tells him that Jeanette was talking about when the Dales were for the elves, and in this city, that could be dangerous. Suddenly, the two hear horses, a nobleman riding through the slums. The two men duck behind an alley to avoid being seen by the nobleman and his guards. But as they pass, a rock flies out of a nearby alley and hits the guards. Lynette peers out, wondering who threw the rock, and sees a small elven boy as the horses screech to a halt. He rushes over to the small boy and stops him from throwing another, and the small boy whispers that these men killed his mother, and they aren't welcome back after what they did to her. Lynette hushes him, but he is slammed against the wall by a guard who has caught them. A voice calls out to the guard, asking if he found the one who threw the rock. The guard looks to Lynette, and then the boy who is still holding a rock. But when he moves to the boy, Lynette catches his boot. There is a moment of understanding and the guard nods, taking Lamette towards the noble, Lord Mainsoray. Lamette closes his eyes, thanking the Maker that there is at least some good humans in this world. Selene wakes up slowly with Briala in her arms. 
She had been sleeping poorly since she gained the throne, and Briala was one of the few things that has helped her sleep well. Briala has been her servant since she was a child, long before she took the crown. She remembers making fun of her dark hair and skin as a child, something she finds beautiful now, although Briala is still secretly ashamed of it. Briala soon awakens and helps Celine with her tea. Celine mentions that Duke Ramash proposed to her again as well, and if she accepts, he will denounce Gaspard. Due to his power, many other lords and ladies will also denounce him, and Celine's seat would solidify. Briella tells her it's a very good offer, but Celine denies it, saying that she doesn't want to lose her. As the two talk, they begin to plan out moves in the game, with Briella trying to get Celine to help the elven people in Orlais. Before they leave for the day, Celine asks Briella to look into what Gaspard has planned, and before she goes, Briella gives Celine a kiss and leaves through the passage behind the mirror. In a few moments, Celine will call for her servants to dress her, and they, along with Briella, will come in, none but the two of them knowing about their time together. Gaspard Ways comped Chantrelle of Valon to a seat in his home in Valrio. Along with the Marquis in Montes Samard, the three sit around before a hunt arranged by the nobles. Gaspard asks Chantrelle what he thinks of the feathered duel from the ball the other night, and he replies that he finds it troubling. Celine has bowed to Ferelden, and using the symbol of the Chevalier as a toy is unacceptable. Chantrelle's father died in the Ferelden War, and he was offended by it all. Gaspard agrees with him and tells Chantrelle that there are others like him who want to take Orlais from Celine, and Chantrelle's hands shake as he agrees to join Gaspard. Gaspard mentions that he will want to speak to Celine privately today on the hunt, and knows that her personal guard will be busy today. Sir Michel found a note on his bed. The letter had been addressed to him, Sir Michel de Chavin, but de Chavin was slanted differently than the other letters. The note only read a time and a place. He know these hunting trips that the nobles plan usually end with some sort of hunting accidents, but he figures he can make it to the meeting and be back in time for the hunt, so off he goes. The Chevaliers are the most prestigious martial training group in Orlais, and only comprised of those of noble blood. Michel was from a line of lesser nobles. He had entered the order with nothing but a letter from Comte Guy de Montfort confirming his nobility and a bag of gold for his tuition. Finally, he comes to the meeting place, a bar in the slums. Inside, waiting, is the bar from the other night, Melcendre. He asks why he is here, and she goes on to say that she doubts that he is actually from nobility. He threatens her that this isn't the first time this has happened, and after an official inquiry, he will be justified. When she doesn't budge, he goes on to say that it would still be an embarrassment to Celine and ask what she wants. She chuckles, snaps her fingers, and every man in the bar draws a blade. Chapter 3 Michelle listens to the noises and asks the bard if there are six. She corrects, and that there are seven. And off he goes, using various techniques from his training. He kills or knocks out all seven, and when he goes after Melcendre, she throws a small bag at him, filled with dust that stuns him, and then he's hit in the back of the head. And the last thing he thinks is how his teachers would be so ashamed of him for not killing the bard first. Selene is worried to find Sir Michelle missing, but she cannot skip the hunt, and so the show must go on. It's obvious that something happened to him, or he would have left a message saying that he would not make it to the event, so she sends out Briala to find him. Selene rides off into the well-kept woods, meeting the other nobles and Gaspard. Did you not bring a bow, Gaspard? Marquis de Montesmar called, bringing his stallion up close. Gaspard looked back. I did not, he said. I would not wish to frighten any of noble birth with the sight of blood. Then what will you drink tonight, cousin? Selene asked without looking over. Gaspard chuckled. You cannot expect to bring down anything without a bow, Lord Chantrelle called over. He was flushed and awkward in the saddle. If need be, Gaspard said, still smiling. I shall use a feather. The nobles went silent. Not your strongest weapon, Selene observed, given how easily you were disarmed last night. The nobles laughed, but it was a nervous laugh, not the rich reaction of a crowd on her side. Had she misjudged last night's victory? The exchange with Gaspard has shaken her, so she calls out for the hunt to begin and rides off ahead of the others. But Gaspard rides up to her. The two begin to chat, Gaspard steadily letting her know that the Duke Ramash is now taking his side after her silence on his proposal. At this point, Selene has had enough and tells him to speak plainly as they are alone. Gaspard laughs at her openness. She asks why he is plotting against her. Is it because she's a woman? And after thinking a bit, he responds that no, it's because she's not Gaspard. She asked why he would threaten her now, while the threat of the mages is at its peak. They argue a bit, and eventually Gaspard removes his mask, and she removes hers. Gaspard raised an eyebrow. You're ceding power to Justinia. I am giving the Chantry one chance to repair itself before I must write my name into history as the Mad Empress who bathed or lay in the blood of his people. 
He shook his head. You always cared too much about what history would say, Selene. Then he leaned forward. Bury me. She refuses, saying that his wife killed her mother. He fires back that her father killed his wife. But it doesn't matter. She cares about the cultural side of Orlay while he cares for the power it has. Together, they will be unstoppable. When she still refuses, he puts a hand on her shoulder, but before he can harm her, she grabs his wrist and Gaspard cries out in pain. His arm burned where she touched him. She tells him that she doesn't need guards to protect herself, pointing to the enchanted ring in her finger. The two hear people coming their way and pull their masks back on. While Celine could tell the guards about Gaspard, he has too many people on his side and there would be war. So, the hunt continues like nothing ever happened. Briella sneaks out of the palace, making sure to be noticed by no one. She heads off into the market as just another elf, hearing rumors that could prove useful, but nothing about Sir Michel. She remembers her past, how hard her parents worked for her to become the main servant to Celine, and try to teach her how to navigate the nobles, and how even Celine helped her by passing on things she was learning herself. Briella then has a memory of the death of her parents. Hiding behind a red curtain, blood slowly soaking into the carpets and onto her feet. Celine on the other side is telling her to be quiet, that the assassins that killed all the servants could come back. She tries to look past Celine's shoulder, but is stopped. Celine wipes her tears, a ring glinting on her finger. Celine believes that someone has tried to kill her and her servants for Lady Matillion supporting her for the throne. Briella is confused. No one but her and Celine knew that she was meeting this Lady Matillion that night, but someone must have found out. Celine tells Briella that she must run, go to the Dalish. She hands her a cloak to hide her ears and a mask to seal Celine's identity, and a fancy clip of Lady Matillion's to sell for money. But before she goes, Celine kisses her and tells Briella to live for her. Briella meets her contact once a month and usually does share information, but today she needs to beg him to find Sir Michel. A cloaked man walks into the bar. Elvin, with his face covered in tattoos, a Dalish mage named Velasan. She remembers how they met. She had made it about as far as Helm Shiral after her parents died and had met human bandits alone on the road. Thankfully, Felisan came in just in time to save her. It had been the first time she saw an elf harm a human, let alone kill one. She had seen in that moment a world where she didn't need to bow her head and try to smile when the coachman grabbed at her as she walked by. She'd seen a life without having to remind herself that rabbit was better than knife ear. She'd seen a world where nobles didn't send out assassins to kill her parents. And then, over a dinner of venison and brown bread, Felisan had listened to her story and told her that if she wanted that world, she needed to go back to Selene. She had never made it to the Dalish camp. The two talk in a park, Briella catching up Felisan on the details of the court, but he dismisses a lot of it, saying that he doesn't like details. She thinks on how he is more like a jester than an ancient figure of wisdom that she had expected. She then asks if he can find Sir Michel, and he agrees to help, asking for something he wore. And then, Briella takes out a bright yellow feather. Chapter 4 Michelle wakes up, slowly testing his body for injuries and his surroundings before opening his eyes. He's in a warehouse, tied to a post and surrounded by crates, and from the looks of it, somewhere in the slums. His armor and weapons are gone, likely taken by the bard who then came into the area he was in. She is surprised to find him already awake. He asks again what she wants, and she begins to try and banter with him but he refuses, only asking what she wants. She goes on to say that Comte Brevin de Chalons, the man who had taken Michelle in, had donated his books to the university upon his death, and it seems that his financial log somehow made it into the wrong hands. In the ledger was money paid to a man in Montfort, known as Le Mage de Sang, who was known to be able to forge papers of a person's nobility status. Comte Revan had seen as young Michel saw promise and paid money to have him use the title of a dead noble and be sent off to become a chevalier. But all this, if it were to come out, was not only a huge scandal, but punishable by death. She goes on to say that she also knows how he is of elven blood as well. She answers closer to him, saying that Gaspard wanted him out of the way for the hunt, and she is excited to tell him what she has found out. But he smashes his face into hers, quickly looping his arms under his feet and choking her. I am Sir Michel de Chavin, he said as he pulled on the rope around her throat. With the last of her strength, Melcendre slid a dagger free from a sheath at her hip. Before she could bring it to bear, Michel yanked his hands up and slammed them down again, smashing Melcendre's head against the ground. She went limp, and he did it again, then again. I am Sir Michel de Chavin, he grabbed the dagger from her unresisting hand and sawed through the ropes that bound him. In moments, he was free, standing over her. Her breast still moved with breath. I am Sir Michel de Chavin, he said again as he knelt beside her and finished it with a clean cut. When he came back to his feet, Gaspard's men were there. 
As Briella watches Felisan work magic, the hair stand up on the back of her neck. The feather she brought shines, and then the two are off, heading towards the elven slums. She asks how his people, the Dalish, are. Beneath his cloak, his face lit up with enthusiasm. They have a wonderful new plan. It ends with the Shemlin killing each other off, leaving the Dales free for the elves to rule. Briella raised an eyebrow. How does it begin? Riding around in wagons, pulled by deer. They're still working on the middle. How fortunate that they have you, Briella said, and Felisan chuckled and shook his head. He asked Briella what she thinks of her work, and she answers that she believes she's doing good for the elves, to which he responds that that feeling does last for a while. He goes on to say that other people will never see the true work she does, or how she helps them. Many will think she has turned her back on her people, and it's really hard. They end up finding the bar that Michelle was kidnapped in and an elven bartender cleaning up inside. He looks worried, likely paid to keep quiet. They find clues as to what happened and continue on the path. They arrive at the warehouse just in time to see armored men rushing in. Inside, Briella hops up on some crates to see Michelle fighting the men, now free and with a stolen weapon. Briella directs Felisan to the maze of crates while she snipes the soldiers with her bow that she got from a cache. Together, they kill the remaining men. Sir Michel is surprised to find Briella there, but also that the Empress's maid can fight. Briella questions what has happened, although Sir Michel is tight-lipped about it. After a moment, she deduces that the Bard led him here to blackmail about his bloodline, and that he has elven blood. Michel is shocked that she can tell so quickly, and before he can act, she strikes up a deal. She will never tell a soul, not even Celine, if he will do one thing, anything, she asks one day in the future. He is unsure, but without any other options, he agrees. As they leave, she tells Felisan that the warehouse needs to be gone, and he happily walks off to burn it down. Duke Ramash and Gaspard walk around the ashes of the warehouse. Gaspard is able to find the elven man that owned the warehouse and questions him. To the best of the man's abilities, he recalls a bard buying the space, taking a man there, and then a man and two elves, one of them Dalish, leaving while it burned down. Gaspard tells the man to talk to one of his servants, saying that he will pay for the building to be rebuilt. The L leaves and Ramash questions if he will actually pay the elf. Gaspard says he will, as he wants them to see that the Empress's people burned down a warehouse and that he is fixing it. While he can't use whatever the Bard had found for him, he has to be able to use the fact that the Empress has two elven spies working for her. And if he can't, he doesn't deserve the throne. Chapter 5 in the slums of Halam Sharal, rebellion was brewing. While many elves died, many of them had done things that others found questionable. But Lamet, he was a good man, and he died trying to save a child. If they killed him, they would kill anyone. The Comte of Halam Sharal had ordered watches doubled, but even more violence broke out, and slowly, word began to spread over Orle. Briala was in the market when Felisan caught her, which was unusual. He tells her the news of Halam Sharal and that the elves are calling for Mein Herald. Briala is furious and shocked. This is the last thing Selene needs right now, don't they know that? Felisan knows that they don't know or care about Selene, but Briala might be able to make it right before anyone else gets hurt. She thanks him and rushes over to the palace. Briala finds that Selene is in a meeting with the university administrator. She takes a tea tray from a serving girl, serves tea for them, and makes eye contact with Celine, a subtle signal that she must speak with her. Briella hands the tray back to the servant and goes to pace in another room, Celine coming in soon after. She tells Celine about what Felisan reported, and she is just as shocked. Briella rose, putting herself in Celine's path. Give them justice! A lord for the death of an elf? I damn this thing! With a quick jerk, Celine tore the mask from her face. Her face was flushed beneath, her eyes red from another night of little sleep. Shall I declare the elves equal citizens before the maker and the throne as well while I'm at it? Why not? Briella took her own mask off, stealing a quick moment to steady herself. Unless you don't believe that and I'm just a jumped up kitchen slut you haven't tired of yet. Celine turns away, telling Briella that she knows she can't just do that. The nobles will rebel against her and Gaspard would take the throne. Briella offers another solution. Send her to kill the lord that started it all. The elves will feel justice, and the rebellion will be quieted. Celine kisses Briella fiercely, telling her to make it clean and quick, and off Briella goes. The next few days are quiet for Celine, although sleeping without Briella has been rough. Three days after Briella had left, Celine goes to a play at the Grand Theater. In history, the theater had a troubled relationship with nobility. It often angered the royals, and the royals responded in kind. But Celine tried to back them, and would openly laugh when she was mocked. In kind, the theater was often nice to her. 
This night, Celine can tell there is something wrong as the owner of the theater looks nervous. When she gets to her box, Celine sends out two of her maids to find out what has happened. The play ends up being a romantic telling of Andraste, a choice she finds odd. Sir Michel opens the door to her box, letting her know that the Duke Ramash is here. She welcomes him and they sit and watch the play together. Against such magic, how can freedom reign? Our forces thus aride will not suffice. But with sweet justice as our own refrain, the elves shall come to aid us once or twice. The crowd laughed nervously and Celine saw the darkness below lighten as hundreds of faces turned up to look at her. Chartan, the heretical elven warrior whose story of joining Andraste's fight against ancient inventor had been stricken from the chant of light, had walked onto the stage. He had been cast as a woman, and she was wearing a dress. Her hips swayed with comic exaggeration and her wooden prop ears huge so that even those at the back of the room could tell she was an elf. She kissed Andraste's hand and the crowd whistled. The Duke mentions that he had paid for the play himself, and he says that in this rendition, Andraste has taken an elven lover and has forgotten the duty of her people. Sling calls him out as this just being a plan for Gaspard. She leaves the box, telling Sir Michel to gather her servants who have not come back. They knew about Briala. Or maybe they didn't and it was a good guess, but at the very least, they knew she was soft for the elven people, and that was going to be her downfall. While she waits for her servants, Liliana appears. She apologizes for the play, saying that it's just so cruel that one of the groups she had supported the most would do this to her. She goes on to hold up some scrolls. It seems various professors in the university were also paid to make research on how the elves were more like rabbits than people. Celine asks what the Divine wants, and Liliana states that while the Divine believes that the elves are also the children of the Maker, Celine never asks for support in this matter, only the mages, which the Divine makes a promise to help stop the mages and Templars from fighting. But in return, she needs to know that the situation with the elves is under control. Sir Michel comes up then with the servants, who look like they have been slapped. Sel mentions that there is talk of the Empress is too relaxed with the elves, and that her and Briala are lovers. Selene straightens out and begins to walk away. There was only one option left, and she hated herself for it. In her mind, she begs forgiveness from Briala as she asks for Sir Michel to gather her forces, for they are about to march on Halm Sheral to crush the rebellion. Discussion. Before we start, I want to talk about something I noticed, and even a correction on the last series on Asunder. All during Asunder, it keeps referring to the Mage Rebellion and Kirkwall happening just a year before the book starts. But in the world of Thetis, this has been corrected, saying that the Kirkwall Rebellion was in 937 Dragon, and most of Asunder and Mass Empire happened in 940, about three years later. So... Yeah, while the book takes the stance that it happened right after, in the overarching lore, it's much later than the Mage Rebellion. But all that being said, World of Thetis can't seem to keep its own timeline with the book straight. It states that the finding of the Cure for Tranquility happened before Selene rides off to Halm Sheral. While in the books, the Ball for the Divine at the start of Asunder hasn't happened yet when Selene watched the play and decides to ride off to Halm Sheral. I bring this all up just to point out the Dragon Age timeline is a big, huge mess sometimes, and we just sort of have to take the vague idea of what they were going for and not really claim that one is more correct than the other. So while World of Theta states that Asunder is happening just a bit before Masked Empire, the text in the two books, it's really the other way around. The beginning of Masked Empire takes place like a month or so before the ball where Evangeline saves the Divine and Asunder. Something that is really, really hard to describe in the summary, but is pretty crucial to how the book is written, are the puzzles and the dialogue. By that, I mean that most of what the people are talking about has one literal meaning, but they all imply something else, something deeper. For the most part, here and continuing on with the novel, I'm going to really only focus on what they are like actually saying and not the fluffy literal text. But know that the dialogue, mostly between the nobles, are a lot more subtle than I'm making it out to be. When Morik is talking about math equations, he talks about one that is a specific ratio found in nature so often that it must reflect the maker's own hand. I can't be certain that the Dragon Age ratio is the same as what I'm about to talk about, but in reality, we have a ratio with the same description, known as the Golden Ratio. I'm not a math channel, I like learned this in high school, so it's been a hot second since I learned about this, but check out the wiki page for a better explanation than I can give. We get our first reference to Madame de Fer, or Vivian, as we know her in this book, although it is very minor. We also find out that Liliana has met the Empress, so that's kind of fun. Anana says, Do we know why Briala looks have changed in Dragon Age Inquisition? Because she is constantly described as someone with dark skin, or at least darker than Selene. 
Like, I agree with you that Fiona is not whitewashed, but Briella is a stronger case, I think. So yeah, let's talk about that. If you remember from The Calling, I waited until the end of the novel to really get into that, and I want to do the same here. But why I do want to wait to the last episode to really get into this, I know that this is going to come up. Overall, I agree with Anana at this point. I'll stand by Fiona not being whitewashed, but Briala is a little dubious. Granted, in-game, Briala is darker than Celine, and while it does talk about Briala having curls, there really aren't any curls in the game. Like, they just don't have it modeled, probably because they couldn't figure out a good way to do it. But yeah, I, I just want to read through the entire book before I actually give my final thoughts, because when I read it the first time, I wasn't really paying attention to what she looked like, because I just assumed it was in-game Briala. But anyway. Yash says, when Briella leaves Celine's bedroom through the secret passage, the passage is hidden behind a mirror, so a mirror opens the passage. This might have been meant to foreshadow the Alluvians, otherwise it's a pretty big coincidence. And you know, I honestly have never noticed that. This, this can't be an accident, this is totally foreshadowing. Maybe even a little Easter egg for people who have read it twice. But yeah, thanks for pointing that out. When Sir Michel had graduated from the Chevaliers, he remembers a custom from the Academy, getting drunk, rolling into the Elven slums, and testing their blade on the Elven people. They are given a reason that the elven people had done crimes, but even if that is true, it would still be really hard to know he actually did them. And Sir Michel did it. We later, like, he, he had done it all, apparently. We later learn that Sir Michel is not only a commoner, but half elven as well. With that in mind, you suddenly know that Michel gave up everything to be a chevalier, even the sympathy to his people. An interesting and super spell inconsistency, but the book mentions that the chevalier technique named Bear Mauls the Wolves doesn't apply when one doesn't have two blades. This technique actually appears in Dragon Age Inquisition as a warrior ability in the Weapon and Shield branch, which, as you might know, you don't get a second blade. So, have fun with that. Something to note, because it confused me, is that Duke Ramache and Comte Chantrel are two different people, and they both asked for Celine's hand in marriage. Ramache was recruited by Gaspard off screen or off text, off the novel, we didn't see it, whatever. But Chantral was recruited in this novel and we actually see that. So I think now is a good time to bite the bullet and show how Celine and Gaspard are related, along with some family history. Despite the 30 year age gap, Celine and Gaspard are actual cousins. Like her father is the brother of Gaspard's mother. But let's also talk about the family in general. So Gaspard married a woman named Calienne de Ghislaine, who is the daughter of Duke Bastien. And yes, this is the same Bastien who was the lover to Vivian. To dissuade Celine from taking the throne, Gaspard's wife killed Celine's mother. Now, Celine's mother was cousins with Duke Prosper, and this is the same guy who Hawk killed in Mark of the Assassin, which as a side note, his son takes over for him, and this is the man you meet in Trespasser representing Orlais. Anyway, in revenge, Celine's father kills Gaspard's wife, but she is able to poison him and later dies from his wounds. Anyway, that's the family tree. It won't be too important moving on with the story, but it's something that many people might be curious about. Much like Asunder, where it hints to events happening in the Masked Empire, we get hints to Asunder in this book. So far, we have seen the setup to the ball where the Divine is almost killed, and later on it talks about merchants saying that something is wrong in Adamant Fortress. Now, in this whole book, it says Velasan has tattoos on his face, but it never actually mentions which one. In a tweet, Patrick Week says that he likely wears one for Mithal. So before I continue, I want to give a fair spoiler warning. I know I don't do this too often on these episodes. I know some of you read and watch the videos at the same time, and this is going to spoil the end of the book. And I think it's a spoiler that I want to keep intact if you don't know what's going to happen. So mute this video, and when this image of Jinx goes away, turn the sound back on. Anyway. All right, fair warning, I'm going now. For those of you who have read the books or don't care about spoilers or just watch the video series, whatever, I want to take a moment to talk about Felisan. When I first read the novel, I loved him. He's a great comic relief character that unfortunately that doesn't really come out in the summary, but that's what happens. And he has some really great moments in the book. And then the end of the book happened and we learned that he is not only an ancient elf, but he was working with Solus. And he was also likely killed by Solus at the end, which that's that's a whole thing, but we'll get to that at the end of the series. So don't just wait on that. So what I want to point out now is that on a second read through, when you understand that he's an ancient elf and he has seen some shit, his dialogue takes on a whole new meaning. Take this, for example. It may be that your empress cannot stop this war. Perhaps the mages and the Templars will destroy each other, and when the foolish and inevitable war comes, the Shemlin will be weak enough for the elves to retake the Dales. We will find out someday. Today you are helping the elves who live under the rule of this empire. Let that be enough. Sure, he might be talking about the elves we know, but he probably isn't. 
when you start to read his dialogue through a lens of him wanting to do what Solus wants to do, things become a lot more sinister. And his dialogue starts to become almost less humorous and more cynical. It's really bizarre. It's it's like it's like playing the game. It's it's like when you first play through the game, you you think Solus is just like, oh, yeah, Solus says some weird things, huh? And then when you replay it again, you're like, oh my god, he was hinting that he was the Dread Wolf the entire time, and I had no idea. It's also interesting that he seems to use the Elven God's name in in vain, I guess. I'm, I'm not quite sure I'd describe it, but he uses their names as modifiers. Like, what in sweet Solus's name is wrong with you? But he refuses to teach Briala of the Elven Gods and how to worship them. Except for Fenharel, mostly. He, he doesn't teach her how to worship him. But throughout the entire book, Felisan keeps telling stories of Fenharel, even that his name, Felisan, is a tale of the slow arrow, in which Fenharel is on no one's side, but will not harm the innocent. And the spoilers are over. Now we'll just go to the outro because I have nothing else to say. And with that, thank you to everyone who submitted entries, and I look forward to what everyone comes up with next. If you have any comments, artwork, or anything else, please send it in. Our next section will consist of chapters 6 through 10 of Mass Empire, and please send me your comments, artworks, literally anything, by November 25th, 2018. Either comment below, send me an email at guildathon at gmail.com, tweet at guildathon on Twitter, or PM user Gilanon on Reddit. Thrash Sheral.